we're back. We're live on a Monday morning. Whoa, Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel, and with me is Dave Stevens. And he is the host, actually, of Cybersecurity, or Cybersecurity, what? what do you call Cyber it? Underground. Cyber, Cyber Underground, Underground, which plays later in the week. But he joined me on this special show, and he is a cybersecurity instructor at KCC Capilano Community College. And uh, we also have um, uh, Andrew Lanning, uh, another host on ThinkTech, um, and he is with, Integrate, with Hibachi Talk, and he is with Integrated Security uh, Technologies. And uh, we have Rodney Thayer, and he's a security engineer. We have all of us together. And guess what we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about the big attack <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, of uh, Wanna, WannaCry, uh, ransomware. Which, WannaCrypt. Uh, well, yeah, well, right, and which makes us all want to cry. Okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> so let's try to examine what happened here, what we can do about it, and you know how it is going to affect our world. First thing is, what is this thing? How does it work, Dave? Well, I think uh, actually Rodney would give you a better explanation of that. Uh, WannaCry is a, is a released tool from the NSA that came out through uh, Shadow Brokers uh, via WikiLeaks. However, it's not on WikiLeaks in a place called Vault 7 where they release most of their stuff like this. It's no longer there. So uh, how it got into the wild, I think probably uh, Rodney can tell you better. Uh, but it's a tool that will uh, encrypt the files on your hard drive and hold them for ransom. And if it sees other computers on the same network, it will try to attack those computers and hold those files for ransom as well. So it's possible your entire network could be held for ransom and take your business offline. Yeah. Oh, that's disgusting. Right. That's, that's existed for a while. That's not anything new. This is no, nothing new. However, this one attacked a specific vulnerability that hadn't been patched by Microsoft until March of this year. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the patch came out from Microsoft, and it only addressed Windows 10 and didn't address Windows XP. And as we know, the National Health Service in Great Britain had been running mostly Windows XP, which had been end of life from Microsoft. It's no really longer, old. It's really old. Uh, Microsoft didn't allow any more security patches. So they were ultimately vulnerable. And unfortunately, uh, they came out with a security patch. Microsoft went back and came out with a security patch for this particular virus for Windows XP, but it's after the fact. Yeah, not so, for not for XP though, because XP is beyond. Uh, no, they came out one for oh, really? one oh. for XP. So oh. there's one now, but they issued it uh, the day after the ransomware, so oh, May 11. That's not too helpful. Yeah. yeah, it's it's helpful, but not. I mean, yeah. the computers that haven't been affected now can be patched. Andrew, didn't you tell me that um, that w with a with an appropriate uh, intrusion into your system, a hacker could change your operating system to one that is more vulnerable? Is that true? Um, actually, no, what, what I was talking about was that it's not uncommon for a hacker, to, if he can gain command and control of a system, to roll back the firmware or the software on that system to a, a version that has known vulnerabilities. So that, that, that's like a vector of attack. So once you own a device, it's, it's not uncommon to, to try to roll it backwards to open it up to other types of attacks, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So let, so, me, let me get it straight. So if you have XP, you're vulnerable. If anybody yeah. rolled you back to XP, you're vulnerable. Yeah. If you have Windows 7, you're vulnerable unless you had a patch. Pretty, right. pretty good idea. So, but, but Microsoft stopped patching XP a long time ago, right? This was just a benevolent act of theirs to come out and yes, do this. Understood. XP should not have been, no one should be using XP. However, we find 150 million users globally are still <laughs> using it, which is, in my opinion, they're them just not moving forward with technology. A lot of businesses will try to drive technology uh, until the very end. And, and unfortunately, XP ended a while back, but they're still getting usefulness out of it. There's just no protection for it. Yeah, now, you know, in China, they got a lot of bootleg software, probably a lot of mm, uh, Microsoft bootleg software. Maybe it's XP, maybe it's 7, maybe it's 10, but it's bootleg. Does it make a difference if it's bootleg so software? Is it more vulnerable? It is more if it's bootleg like software, then it's probably got backdoors or something in it. But otherwise, it's just it's just the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Let um. Th this one's kind of interesting because of the way it moves around, and I think Rodney could could give us some background on on SMB one and two and why this is there's such a problem with this software. Hey, Rodney, why don't you do that? Sure. So uh, so the the once this thing uh, compromised the machine, it uh, it puts the ransomware in. So that's that's the whole ransomware encrypts your disk stuff. Um, the thing that's, that is relatively new about this is how did it get into people's systems? So this exploit that they fixed in March um, affects a protocol that Microsoft uses to have machines share files and, and uh, printers and other kinds of resources with each other. So it's called server message block. It's a very old protocol. It's been 
around since the late 80s, it's been evolved over time. Uh, and there have been holes known here and there in this protocol. Uh, and apparently what happened is that the, the bug that the NSA had, there was a possibility to have one computer uh, execute a program on another computer without its permission using this server message block technology. Mm -hmm. So the, the series of events seems to be that the bad guys send phishing emails or somehow otherwise convince somebody inside a business to uh, click on a link or something and somehow run a program. Uh, also, they they worry about uh, macros in office documents. Um, so somehow the bad guy gets you to execute a program on a computer that takes over that one machine and then uses this exploit uh, against server message block to move among the machines inside your business, uh, and then it would and it would replicate across that. So there's there's three or four layers of failed technology here, and the ransomware is the thing at the end of it. Uh, but but it's the um, it's the networking between machines the, the there was a vulnerability in that and that's what that's what this is about yeah so you know if you got one of these machines on your network somewhere maybe like in my world as a, as a physical security systems integrator perhaps somebody's got a, an old badging workstation for example that makes their badges for their access control system and maybe they're running it still running an XP machine because it's not something they use very often so you know a real world example of that would be a, dev a, a device like that sitting around on a network that's not been patched in a long long time mm -hmm. and was vulnerable to this attack mm -hmm. did i hear you say uh, though uh, rodney that you got to click on something to activate this ransomware it doesn't happen all by itself it's not autonomous you got to actually that, that, do something that's the current understanding now if you if uh, this is one of these things where you know, we're all caught off balance trying to chase this. So the, my understanding is the current thinking is they don't know precisely, precisely what it does at the at the initial moment of compromise. Um, and clicking on a, a link from bad email is the most common way. Uh, the other thing they're talking about is that with Microsoft systems is a thing called remote desktop protocol, which is so you can have a remote site connect into a server and do maintenance work. And so people will sometimes allow remote desktop in from the outside world. And there was there. There's potentially an issue with that related to this. And this is one of these things where, you know, it's kind of like Ebola. We got thousands of scientists sitting around trying to look at samples in labs, figuring out how what's going on with this thing. We don't have a complete explanation yet. Yeah. And there are, uh, am I right to say, Dave, you were talking about the possibility of having multiple variations of this? You can it's have not many just variants, one yeah. ransomware. It's it's got various versions. Sure, I'll, I'll give you a great example. WannaCry right now was uh, thwarted by a 22-year-old uh, security engineer, um, and uh, what he found was that there was a, there was a failsafe fail built in. When it starts to execute, this virus will go out and look for a website. If the website is actually active and has a website, it discontinues its attack. So that website wasn't ever registered. The domain was never registered, and so this, this uh, ransomware would go out to the Internet, not find that website, and continue its attack. So the security engineer went and bought that domain name for ten bucks, and <laughs> really and put a, a and put a fake website up, and and now it's kind of a sinkhole for this this first variant of of WannaCry. It'll go out and check the website. Oh, the website's there, and discontinues the attack. <laughs> However, that's just a script. So the moment it uh, somebody sees that that's that's the vulnerability of that virus, they'll just change that. They'll take that out. So now we have to look for more ways to to end this. Yeah. So it can be changed, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, let's, let's, hey, yeah, Jay, we, I've got some additional insight on that. I sat in a presentation last week, last week uh, at PSA Tech, and the keynote was um, uh, Matthew Rosenquist, and he's the cyber strategist for uh, Intel's global operations. Uh, they're tracking about 400,000 variants per day oh. of malware oh. Oh, globally. Oh. <laughs> Not only this, but all the all the malware. <clears throat> all the malware, yeah. Four hundred thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's kind of hard to stop. <laughs> it is kind of hard to stop. We live in a new world. Uh, but let me let me just uh, sort of um, relate back to some of the things you guys have said. Number one. You didn't mention Apple, so I guess Apple is not in the in the target this area. This is not a my, uh, this is an, a Microsoft vulnerability. Microsoft yeah. only, and, and it's only XP uh, without the patch, which is came late, uh, uh -huh. and seven with the without the patch, right? Microsoft seven. Well, this can affect any computer all the way up through Windows 10, until that security patch that was released in March is applied. So you yeah, need the patch on so Windows XP, 10 also. Vista, seven. 
Right, so the current version of Windows 10, they put out a patch as their regular operating procedure. Uh, if you don't have Windows 10, you should really upgrade and then apply the patch. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing uh, that I caught here is that if you don't click on anything, or if you're not using that Microsoft protocol, um, you're safe. As, 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 that's, that sounds like an overstatement. We don't know that for certain yet. <laughs> From what Rodney said, we don't know. But usually the way in for a virus, now 90% of, of uh, attacks currently are social first. Someone gives you a USB drive, you plug it in. Someone sends you an email, you click on a link. Uh, those, those things that we, we fool humans into doing something that executes sure. something like on a computer. Right. And usually we're logged in as, you know, if you log into your computer, you're the administrator. So if you click on something, whatever's executing is your permissions on there. So God writes to your computer. What, what really prevents this is user training. That's the first thing you got to tell people, don't click on these kind of links. If you don't know who it's from, delete that email. Well, suppose you do know who it's from, but it's phony anyway. I worry about getting, you know, getting a nice looking email. It's, there's nothing suspicious about it, but a machine generated it somewhere else, and it's not the guy that it pretends to be. Is this possible? This, this is possible. Um, the example I was given is that inside NASA, there, there, are people, there are bad guys chasing engineers inside NASA, looking specifically like the guy who works on pumps and rocket engines or things like that. Um, you know, the, the specific team members they'll be focusing. Right. So the uh, phishing emails can get can be very, very sophisticated. The other thing about this is it's ransomware, which means one of the things it does is it catches you having bad backups. You know, there is a, there is a line of reasoning that says you should do backups because, for example, your building might burn down. Uh, and you should you should have you should have backup copies of your files, and you should be doing backups uh, frequently enough so that you can survive rolling back to the last backup. That's just standard data processing techniques. And so you know the ransomware guys are catching people having bad backups. So that's the other thing going on here. Yeah, the other thing we we see is people doing a backup, doing a backup, doing a backup for months on end with ever ever testing one. So testing you need to make backups. sure that your backup files are actually restorable periodically as well. Yeah, you bet. Um, so I, I wonder, I wonder, you know, we, we touched a little bit on how this got out from NSA, did you say? Mm. Um, and it came out through Julian Assange at WikiLeak. He, he had uh, ripped them off for that and then somehow distributed. Well, it, and there was a group called Shadow Brokers. And again, I think Roddy could probably speak better to this, but there's a group called Shadow Brokers who sells this kind of technology when they get a hold of it. And when it's not saleable, they'll just release it to the wild. Um, the, the theory with a lot of, of, of I say, gray hats out there, the kind of the situational moral kind of hackers, they, they want to put every vulnerability out there and every tool out there to make people more aware so they can uh, reinforce their systems. If they know there's a vulnerability and they know there's a tool to attack it, then you'll, they'll patch their systems. The problem is nobody pays that close of attention to these scenarios. So unless everybody participates all the time, that theory doesn't work out very well. Yeah. So NSA actually invented this, designed it, That's wrote what this they code. Think, yeah. NSA yeah. or CIA. It doesn't make well, the U.S. We, look we too good. We don't know that they actually. invented it. We know they were using it. Uh, the, the NSA and lots of other organizations have been buying weapons for a long time. They've been buying cyber weapons from people. So there are hackers out there who have been selling exploits to the government, the military, not just ours, but other people's. Uh, so, yes, the NSA has got lots of smart people and they might have invented this themselves, but what we know is they were using, they were using this weapon. We don't know if they invented the weapon. Well, you know, just, just a, a, a sort of a, a point on that is that, so, so suppose I'm in Russia or China and I got badly burned by this ransomware and I, you know, I don't, gosh, I don't know what you do when you get nailed. We should talk about that. Um, now, is, is there justification for me to blame the United States? For Ru starting this up? Currently, Russia is. <laughs> right <laughs> okay. now, Russia put out a statement that they, they blame the U.S. for this attack. Yeah, well, yeah. they do. Everyone will, don't you think? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to go down. <laughs> I, I know that in, in, in my personal point of view, if a company really wants to be safe, they'll have a security plan, which includes patches and updates and upgrades and backups and, and user training. And if you don't have a security plan, it's kind of your own fault. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it, no matter where the attack comes from, you didn't prepare properly for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we live in different times. So I'm getting a headache about this, and whenever I get a headache, I, I'm going to take a break. Okay. So we take a short break from my headache. We'll headache be right break. back, and we'll talk some more about it, the global implications of what's going on. We'll be right back.
This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go! 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 Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Welcome back, welcome back to Community Matters. I'm Jake Fidel, and we have Andrew Lanning on the phone, Integrated Security Technologies, uh, and we have Rodney Thayer with him. He's a, a, a security engineer. Um, and of course, we have Dave Stevens, and he is a professor of cybersecurity at Copyright Community Colleges here in the studio. So you guys, um, and just, you know, we wonder where this all takes us, because it's, it's, it's really chilling and shocking. We knew this kind of stuff was happening, but this is on a scale much larger. This is on a scale you bring down major institutions in major countries. Who, so what happens when you bring them down? Do they, do they run off and get uh, bitcoins? Um, how do they pay the ransom? Do they pay the ransom? What, what follows the attack? So the proper thing to do is don't pay the ransom, um, contact your local law enforcement, and go load your good validated backups that you made within the last week or so. <laughs> load your system and move on. Suppose uh, you don't have good validated... Law enforcement, but don't pay the ransom, please. Why not? Uh, Why not? It's okay. This only this only helps the criminal enterprise grow its machine. So you don't want to fund that, right? And again, this you know we 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 had this discussion about you know cybersecurity is, is people, it's processes, it's products, right? So in this instance, we've got people using old, outdated product at Windows XP that shouldn't even be in use in the enterprise. Actually, no no one should be using it anymore. It died a long time ago, right? And then you've got processes where people. Um, didn't update Windows 7, Windows 8, or Windows 10, right? Because they don't accept automatic updates from Windows for various reasons. So there's a process there that in some cases allowed this to occur. And then there's the people side of it where some people just don't want their, they don't want, like an administrator may say, I'm not going to accept all these updates because perhaps it causes problems to other systems he has. Not a, not an invalid reason, but he's got to understand and have some, you know, there's a liability, there's a risk assessment that has to happen when you make that sort of decision not to accept the current updates from a manufacturer for their product. So, you know, all three legs of that stool sort of got exposed by this. And, you know, the, I think the product piece, you know, with Windows XP, 150 million machines still being out there in the wild, uh, that's, you know, people really driving their technology a little too long. This is a hard lesson to learn for IT, IT departments, and, and I've worked for several companies like this that want to get the best return on investment for their, for their money, and, and budgets get cut in IT all the time because IT people are highly creative and, and we're, we, we can adapt. Uh, the problem is when you can't upgrade your systems to the current systems that are the most secure, you're helpless. And no matter how many times you warn people, look, you're, you're assuming too much risk, you could crash this this could hit you what what affects the business is the loss of business continuity so your profitability ceases to exist if say you're Amazon and you got hit by this thing uh, how many seconds can you be offline for Amazon and, and lose a million dollars probably a couple of seconds what happens if you're down for six hours you've lost the significant piece of, uh, of change that you can no longer provide to your shareholders. Say nothing about goodwill. Goodwill PR, it's, yeah. it's, it's a yeah. bad public relations, it's a nightmare. But if you have a good security plan and people are adopting this security plan and sticking by it, this is one of the things you should be paying attention to. Yeah. Well, the very yeah, this same is, guy. This is the kind of enterprise risk people have to look at. Uh, and by the way, if you pay the ransom, so you have to go to your CFO and say, I need money to pay a ransom. I would have thought that would have been the list of things that's kind of naughty to spend company money on. <laughs> <laughs> not going to help your career, that's for sure. That's not Especially <laughs> when he says, how come we got into this predicament? Accounts well, payable would be I'll awesome. I'll give you another questions. one. So, you know, you got to pay via Bitcoin. So if you're in Hawaii, you know, the state's outlawed Bitcoin here. Yeah, no, there's no exchange. Yeah. There's no exchange in Hawaii. Well, let's assume you find a Bitcoin. I mean, or the sufficient Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's assume, you know, let's assume you, you make some calls and you get somebody to, you know, help you with Bitcoins. Yeah. Can we trace the Bitcoins or are they completely untraceable? No, you can't trace we'll everything on the internet. Love to find I'm these sure. guys and, you know, and put them in jail, no? Well, they can move it, on rather quickly, though. That's the problem. Is there, is there any way we can catch them? Is there any way we can, you know, deter them by punishment? Punishment. 
That's uh, well, since the code was released publicly, I'm I'm just going to guess that them is a whole bunch of criminal different criminal enterprises, right? <laughs> and even if you did catch somebody, uh, there's a cross border problem. Uh -huh. So yeah. they could be attacking from Slovenia, and or 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 Poland, and we have no jurisdiction in those those countries. So it'd be an international nightmare to try to get some kind of some some empathy from that country to go arrest those people and help us prosecute them that this is a huge problem and what if they're in a, a, a country that's that's uh there's animosity between us and that country uh, russia for instance what if you know there was a North, player in russia north korea for instance north korea <laughs> yeah they don't care uh so uh, even if we could catch them prosecuting them is, is very difficult well the, that's the irony i mean you you i mean i don't know about north korea but china has been hit um certainly europe has been hit russia has been hit and we've been hit so, yeah. where, you know, is there a state actor? Could there be a state actor in a state which has been hit? How so, does that work? So last well, year, the, uh, Edward Snowden actually tweeted hit, that. But, you know, has anybody really unwound all the pieces? Uh, you know, not trying to pick on Russia. And a state actor could cause some self-inflicted damage just to make sure it looks good. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I don't know. Russia took a lot of damage. I mean, their, their main cell phone company, Megafon, got hit. Uh, they have over 70,000 hits as of Friday. Um, that's they were the biggest hit country. I mean, so self-inflicted damage. That's pretty bad. Does anybody know if they paid their ransoms? <laughs> well, I have no idea. Even if I did pay the ransom, I wouldn't tell anybody about it. And you yeah, should know that heard, if you pay the ransom, a website up that's counting the payments. You you will should you should know that if you pay the ransom, it's just like someone kidnaps somebody you love and you pay the ransom. They're under no obligation to give back. Actually, what so they you may took. not get your data back. You may not get your data back. However, and sometimes. Uh, hackers will reuse the decrypt keys for these attacks. So if you're attacking you know, thousands of computers, you don't want to create a, a unique key for each computer, you might reuse it. Sometimes the NSA will have that key on file and they publish it on their website. And it will open your machine up That's again. right, they yeah. can decrypt with those keys. Well, I think you know, what's, what strikes me is this is really an extraordinary event. It's in one day, it's global, it's affecting everyone around the world. Um, it's, I'm sure it's affecting the state of Hawaii, which must be on old computers, sorry, and uh, probably PCs. We, we haven't heard about that yet, but I'm not going to comment on that. Okay, yeah, not on that. Uh, yeah, but so, you know, what I get is, um, is there an end here? Is there, there's an end in sight? <laughs> or is this just going to keep on going on? Are these guys, they're going to be encouraged, <laughs> no. even if they get only one in a hundred ransoms, they're going to be encouraged. And, yeah. and furthermore, you know, other people will jump in on it. And before you know it, we'll have a whole world of black hats or somebody uh, attacking us, not only today and tomorrow and this week, but all the time. How is this going to evolve? You guys have some view of the future you want to share about this? There could I can, be a, I other can just reason. tell you that this, uh, the stats that uh, Matt Rosenquist was talking about is, you know, the criminal enterprise piece of this is going to move uh, from a half a billion dollars a year in revenue up, they're not going backwards. So you can you can take that for what it is. There's also uh, more nefarious pur purposes sometimes for these attacks. They can be uh, a misdirect. They could make you want to look in one area or test the waters to see if they can actually do damage in an area before they do a real attack. So state players will often do this, and I, I wouldn't I wouldn't doubt that the attacks on on Sony twice from North Korea were prefaced with some kind of a smaller attack to see if they could test the waters sure. to see if that was effective sure. before they really attacked hard. And I'd, I'd hate to think that this was a testing the waters because if this was, a, a global incident like this could take everybody down. Gosh, yeah, what happens? Yeah, we, yeah. we don't know this. We don't know what the actual target was here. We, we assume it's the ransom, but you know, the Bitcoin, well, but Bitcoin's anonymous. You can look up for an individual Bitcoin account how much money it's got. So last statistic I saw was that they really had only earned about $25,000 so, so far from this thing. So the, the Bitcoin, I guess there's some Bitcoin addresses hard-coded in the, the exploit that was around a few days ago. As we've said, it's going to morph into this. So yeah. this whole thing could be a cover for them trying to steal the recipe to Coca-Cola. We, we don't know <laughs> exactly what they're doing. Yeah. Which would be yeah. nice to have. Yeah. Right. I want that. Yeah. Not new coke. <laughs> well, you know, you know, this does suggest though. I mean, we, we always knew this was gonna happen. Didn't we know this I, this or something like this would happen? Of course, especially when, when you go to the, the, the leaders of a company and they dismiss these warnings. 
Um, you know, as a company owner, I think a small, medium, large business owner, your responsibility, your fiscal responsibility, fiduciary responsibility is to reduce the amount of risk your shareholders and stakeholders experience at any given time. And when you dismiss security warnings, you've increased your threat landscape and you've increased more risk that you're assuming. So there's a chance you could lose tremendous amounts of money. So, I mean, just look at Google and Facebook paid out uh, just recently here over $100 million in fake invoices because they were victims of a phishing scam. Mm, wow, fabulous. And that's Google. Yeah, incredible, <laughs> incredible. So, you know yeah, what? Some of, the, some of this stuff is, is just business practices. You know, businesses are supposed to keep decent records and make sure the records are robust. You know, the IRS might show up and have to audit you for the last seven years or right. various things. The SEC, other kinds of organizations. So. The, the idea that companies aren't doing clean backups is a is a business process comment, not just a cybersecurity hacker thing. Well, what does this tell us? I mean, to me, it's it's really scary because it's everywhere. I mean, even the Russians can't control it, right? <laughs> even if they started it, or the Chinese, even if they started it, or the North Koreans, for that matter. Um, but you know, just just wonder what this means is from a business point of view. A lot of people are going to lose access. To their data, and it's going to slow the economy. It's going to slow business. It's going to it's going to really separate people from from making money. Um, but it also shows how how you can have global effect in almost no time. And it it scares me in the sense this is bad, but it scares me in the sense that I see in here the possibility that state actors could bring the whole bloody system down. They don't want to ransom. They just want to crush the society. They want to crush the grid. They want to crush all the data. They could attack. And this must be in the military, you know, thinking about this. And in, I mean, so cyber. Uh, what Kapersky's working on this. I'm sure Norton's working on this. Microsoft must be working all night on this. Yeah. Um, are we going to be able to control this, um, or is this just going to go on? And can we ever really escape this possibility? So you brought up an interesting point, and the reason I assume that a, a state agency of some kind, either our country or another, actually created this virus is there was a safety protocol in there to go look for a website and stop if they couldn't find the website. So someone actually knows the gray goo scenario, which is if you have an automated self-replicating uh, bot that consumes, say, organic material, and you, you let it loose and it replicates so fast that within a couple of days the entire earth is dead and it looks like gray goo everywhere. There's no safety protocol in to stop those bots from replicating too fast to be controlled. The same thing that could happen uh, with this virus. And if you release something like this into the wild, what's to stop it from infecting every computer everywhere all the time? And as soon as someone activates an old computer, you've got it back again. So there was a control protocol put into place. So I would imagine somebody uh, created this tool who was thinking about that. What yeah. if this got out, out of control? But now that we've, we've gone beyond that, though. Yeah, now it's morphing and people are going to change this is, it. Not only is it a test to see how well they can, how much damage they can wreck, but it's a test to see what other things they can think of. <laughs> to, right. To get even worse next time. You guys have any closing uh, remarks, uh, Rodney and Andrew? There, there are a lot of uh, safety guidance you know, suggestions out there in general. Uh, you know, making your network safe, doing updates, uh, segmenting your network from the public internet, all these kinds of things that, you know, it's, it, you know, one sounds like one starts droning when you say these things over and over, but it really is, you know, that's why we have safety rules in place to deal with this sort of thing. That's why we suggest you wear seat belts while you're driving, because there are good reasons. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is, a, this is a reminder to everybody that they actually need to pay attention to some of that stuff. Yeah, and from my perspective, it, it's just that that three-legged stool. Make sure you you know you're training your people, you're you're measuring your processes, you're following the policies you've implemented, uh, you know according to the risk appetite that you have, and, and then again, make sure that the products that you're using can be secured, you know, to to the best of your ability. Yeah, that that would be my finding close a closing argument. Also, is that I agree with these guys. All those should be in a plan that your company signs off on, and the company leadership agrees with you and supports you and gives you the money to implement that. All I can say is you guys know about this, and that means they're going to be beating a path to your door. You're all going to be busier than you ever thought. Man, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> That's Dave Stevens at KCC and Andrew Lanning at Integrated Security uh, Technology um, and Rodney Thayer, Security Engineer. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us on this very important discussion. Aloha. Thanks, Jay. Aloha, everybody. Thanks.